related to individualism is explicitly and systematically carried on by Shmuel Eisenstadt in his book on Japanese culture, which started in the late 19th century when there were, when there were major reforms within Japan, but were then transformed over the 20th century, continually reshaped as the Japanese culture and activities adapted these innovations from abroad and made them more and more integrally Japanese. These are some of the roots that inform the book, which is on the reading list a little higher, by Megan Kalman and I called The Third Sector, starting with the, with the, with the Protestant Calvinist origins and then spreading globally. That's why these origins are important even for people today in China, in Japan, and elsewhere, where these, these ideas of nonprofits, this third sector, organized groups, separate from government, separate from private individuals, are, are, are ways of doing culture, doing civic activity, doing more. <coughs> the book was commissioned by the Chinese Ministry of Culture initially, and then we revised it in English. <coughs> um, it has, it has four or five ideal types, sort of cultural perspectives, organizational cultures in a sense. One is bureaucracy, another is patriarchy, another is civic participation, and another is professionalism. And these competing organizational perspectives embattled sometimes within the same foundation or the same organization, even in federal and local government agencies. Are important. These are important to understand the diversity of these perspectives, and, would, and because this is in part what we see and experience today, on the tube, on and social media, looking in, on on this campus and elsewhere, there's lots of diversity in getting a sense of why and how these people think and talk and feel the way they do is what we're trying to capture some of here. We had, we had the question of uh, why, do, why don't you want to live in North Dakota? And, and you remember the corollary the, or this national finding. What's the, re, what's the relative growth rate of 25 to 34 year olds in the whole US and where is it highest? Chicago. Why is the question? And today the theme of music, the art, and how the scene links these together is our, is our, is our focus with Lollapalooza. We saw the show there. What, are its, what in turn are its sources, its historic sources? It's really ethnic music. In, in the 19, if we go back just a little bit to the, say the 1920s, this was the murder, murder capital of the world as it is today again. <coughs> My alderman in Bronzeville was the bodyguard of Mayor Big Bill Thompson, who was the mayor who looked the other way and with his hand out to Al Capone in the abolition era of the great gangsters. As you know from the movies, culture, Dick Tracy, we may so show some snippets if there's time, but take a look at Warren Beatty's Dick Tracy film if you haven't seen it, terrific. The women, I'll mention briefly again, gender roles. The women started Chicago's cultural explosion. The wife uh, of Mayor Bolandic, uh, then Jane Byrne, mayor, then Mayor, Daly's, uh, mayor Daly II's wife, Maggie Daly, and his commissioner of cultural affairs, these were key ladies bringing a cultural sensitivity to Chicago that was not here at all 40, 40, 50 years ago. Or put differently, it was part of the private sector. There was the symphony, there was the university, there was the, the opera. It was not government. It was not, it was laughed at, ignored by city hall and the mayors and the city council members. This has totally changed. The background was ethnicity. Was, this was a city of ethnic politics. And how did ethnicity then join with this? There, in terms of the parades, the key parades in Chicago were epitom epitomized by the St. Patrick's Day party, the Chicago River was dyed green, green ties, green hats, uh, <coughs> and the dailies and others marching with their, with their um, their, their, uh, their outfits in, in parades within individual neighborhoods with, long, with strong Irish precinct captains. Um, but over the years, after it started with uh, a Polish festival, um, Polish music, gospel, jazz, hip-hop, rock. The ethnic ties of these has weakened. So we now have 
some, as you saw in the video, some hundred and, you know, hundreds of bands playing even quasi-simultaneously of many, many different stripes. And no longer is music so primordial, so specifically linked to an ethnic background as it was at the beginning. So music can be primordial, but it can also be transformational and trans-ethnic. Trans <coughs> How can race be more generally untangled from politics and ideology in neighborhoods in this most racially charged and politically culturally explosive city? Like Mocus for LA with the zebras and with breaking the rules of the normal culture and trying to do things differently, what are one or two quick comments on, on these transformations for, for, um, uh, for Chicago and for, for the U.S. And, and for the world more generally? The civil rights leaders of the NAACP, the Urban League, SCLC, SNCC, in the 50s and early 60s promoted racial integration and civil rights. Having the right to vote was the number one theme of Martin Luther King, who was the national champion. The largest racially integrated housing project in the U.S. where I live today is called Prairie Shores on Martin Luther King Drive. <coughs> the, the creative father of this was Ferd Kramer, who was probably the most important civic leader in Chicago in the 40s, 50s, early 60s, who was a socially liberal Jewish chairman of the company Draper and Kramer. In the mid-60s, Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton published an infamous book entitled Black Power, and launched the raised, the raised fist symbol. <coughs> Carmichael was the activist militant head of SNCC, and Hamilton was professor here in political science, I think at Roosevelt. When Stokely was giving one of his first speeches in Chicago on black power, a young USC college student in a, was in attendance, and when he asked for questions, hers was, why do you need those goons next to you left and right? The goons were guys with guns, big guns, and bullets across their chests looking like Black Panthers. Very serious, very tough. She challenged them. How come you need these goons, Stokely? Think of that question. Her name was Tony Preckwinkle. She was a student in one of my classes with her future husband. They became high school teachers, then she was alderman for a dozen years and is now the president of the Cook County Board. She's the highest ranking African-American political leader in Chicago and launched Obama. It's a great story on how she did this in the, in the, in the New Yorker magazine with Michelle Obama with bullets across her front <laughs> and Mr. Obama looking as if he's Mr. Nehru in a white Indian style, style suit. So racial integration versus black nationalism is a deeply divisive theme in, the, in that family and more generally, even if she's been large, was largely silenced while he was president on that theme. Uh, Tony Preckwinkle was at a conference on Hyde Park and racial integration and racism when she, she spoke with the president of the university. The, it was a huge room, huge conference and how racist Hyde Park was in the 40s and, and, and onward with racial covenants and the like. I asked, I asked what were the policies uh, concerning race or integration of the aldermen adjacent to Hyde Park. She said she couldn't speak for the others, but in her own ward, the only kind of integration that she could talk about was economic. Race was too hot to talk about. Yet privately, her husband was white and she had backed Obama. Racial integration is one of the deepest issues dividing African Americans and the line are clear. The distribution of national preferences looks like that. Either you're yes or no. There are very few people in the middle who say no or, or I don't know. Uh, <coughs> uh, I was in, Bronzeville, in a Bronzeville meeting with Michelle Obama and a few dozen civic leaders and we were discussing the topic of this very course how to use arts and culture to transform Bronzeville from, from gospel to public concerts to art galleries. The same thing continued. In the, in the meeting at lunch, um, uh, <coughs> um, her then state senator husband came in for a brief visit. As he walked in, there were mutters in the room, sell out, disloyal, no good bum, and more. 
No one looked him in the face, and these comments were more to the floor and as asides. So the policy question of how to build alternative conceptions of race and links into civic activities is and as poli politically realistic alternatives for people to live by, entertain themselves with, and choose the neighborhood to live in is as racially charged as it could be in this city where when Harold Washington was baptized, when, when the, under the Washington administration, this, the city was baptized by the Wall Street Journal as Beirut on the lake. Um, this became national stuff again with Ferguson, Missouri. If you want to read in Wikipedia a little more on, the stroll is an African-American symbol that I, I'll, I'll talk about. I'm, I'm, we're not, we're not going to have time to do that now, but the themes very quickly, neighborhood, black pride, broken windows theory, Bratton, the police chief, James Q. Wilson, Black Lives Matter, surveillance, police confrontations nationally, and the recent crime explosion in Chicago, distinctively. Alternatives, how redefine neighborhoods and their culture? The deeper structures of cultural themes, for the deeper structure of this, turn to the Old South in America. And we'll just cite a few leading cultural artifacts. Gone with the Wind, the most widely viewed film in the world. More Swedes have gone to Gone with the Wind than have seen all of Bergman's films combined, as our, um, our film major may, 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 may know about this. Uh, <coughs> uh, the most, <coughs> what was the quintessential symbol of power and hierarchy in Gone with the Wind? The White House, where dinners, balls, social events were held. This was the closest American variation to the European aristocratic life that we saw bits of with Versailles and Habermas's book about the courts in Russia, in Versailles, in Italy, in Spain, and so forth. The grand mysterious house was also the iconic symbol of power, money, and hierarchy in the four great novels by probably America's leading novelist, William Faulkner. So maybe we can get ready for a little bit, please. <coughs> um, and I'll give you a, a, a brief summary of one or two themes as, as you're getting a little bit here for just a, a shot of him, of, of Faulkner himself, sorry, of Faulkner himself. But in light, in the novel Light in August, Sutpen comes to Yachtenbataka, to Nepapa County, this mysterious location in Mississippi where, where Faulkner centered all of his novels. And Sutpen's Hundred, it was called, Hundred Acres in the Middle of a Forest, which somehow he had acquired, no one knew how, and he arrived with many, many African-American men on horseback, walking and on horseback, there was a French architect from the Caribbean, and he designed the house. The house was the grand symbol of the town, and let me, let me just, just, say, just say a word or two more, then, then, then we'll move into this. <laughs> um, Faulkner himself lived in a large house, as you'll see, but, the, but the, the symbolism of this raises the question of, I mean, what's, what's the style? The normal style and interpretation of this, you know, white racism, white domination. What perspective did Faulkner take on this? Not that. He looked much more closely within the house. I won't go into the, all, all the details, but just, just one, one point was during the Civil War when Sutpin himself, the master of the house, was in the, in the, in the Confederate Army fighting, leading, leading, leading the neighborhoods, and leading the neighbors in the war, the leading member of the town whose daughter married Sutpin hid her father in a hidden room in the house and fed him for four years through a wall as he was hiding away because he refused to fight with the Confederacy because he was against slavery. Okay, I knew this from Faulkner. Last year there was a talk here in the sociology department by the leading Columbia sociologist. Anybody, can anybody help me with his, with his name? Anybody else see it or remember, remember his work? He's done work on networks and the history of English 
the English leadership, the transformations. He's done work on medical sociology. He, he's now he's studying, he's, he's studying lynchings. And he's gone back and he's tried to assemble data on all the lynchings across the South in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, and most of the, and he, so he, he discussed these, the, the, the lynchings and I'll just mention one, one, one very brief story, let's say, <coughs> well, okay. Um, the, the quick bottom line linking, linking this to Faulkner is in something like 40% of the southern lynchings that he got data on, the mayor and the local government officials intervened, tried to stop the lynchers, arrested them, and tried to give a fair trial to the man who was being accused of, of doing something wrong. That is, not only was it one character in Faulkner's novels, roughly 40% of elected officials in the South, okay, how many sociologists have ever told you that or published this in the ASR? I mean, I'd never heard the number before, and I, I don't think he, 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 was, he was shocked himself, but it came from digging in, 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 in these data and then digging out what the complexities of some of this, which is what I'm suggesting we find in Faulkner as we, let me just add one more line to Faulkner in terms of themes and, and complicated, complicated motifs. There's a, there's a great two volume biography of Faulkner and in one section of it, there's a discussion of, I think it was Faulkner's uncle ran for uh, the state senate of Mississippi and he was elected. The day after the election, his opponent, who almost who ran against him, came up in the middle of the town, shot him in cold blood. Okay, so the shootings we have in Chicago are not specifically African American, but they are part of the Southern tradition, which is related to aspects of hierarchy and revolutions against it, and which continue in Black Lives Matter, in ISIS, and more. But let's let's just look a, a little a little bit at Faulkner here, as I bet many of you haven't seen much of this stuff. You can tell from the, the sound, it's a little dated. If we... This is Oxford, Mississippi, the home of the University, University of Mississippi. Simply arithmetic, 4,000 inhabitants isn't many. 4,000 not counting the university. But all the lives in even a small town are too many to set down in a novel. So a writer overlays one life with another till they become a mean, many mean. As a writer gives timeless life to a few of the few, so does history choose the few of the few for what they've accomplished. Here in Oxford, Lafayette County, Mississippi, we have a citizen who refers to himself as a farmer farmer who also writes. This is William Faulkner of Oxford, Mississippi. He this broke his back four town, times falling off riding horseback. <laughs> but the name of William Faulkner is spread throughout the world as one of the greatest American writers of fiction today. He walks in the way you can tell it, you can tell his walk from the broken his back. His friends are the friends of his boyhood. Phil Moon Muller, Mac Reed, Phil Stone, Ike Roberts. And what he writes about, he has always known because it has been a part of his life.
November 10th, 1950, was announced from Stockholm. Let's, let's the flash forward, sir, because we're, we're going to run out of time. Where was that going? Just, uh, yeah. just nine. Minute well, nine. Just a little bit there. Howdy, Clem. Hey, that's wonderful. Okay. Yeah. It is now as collector's items. Wonder how things turn out. People may persecute you and revile you, but this would only bring the old quickly to your side. Hello, Bill. Uh, how you get along? Just fine. Why you there, Queens? Had a good trip. Yes, sir. Nice country. I had to get back in time to go deer hunting, though. We don't get to visit this time, do we? Down there by the rug. Yes, sir. Can't be acting six four years. They ought to get in sooner or later. Well, if we don't get on the gun, we will with a stick. Yeah. I'll tell you how we're going to do it. All right. We'll let Lucky and Will Lewis build a corral out of Fritz Cane, and you can work them together with a handful of cobbles. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Bill. Hey, a lot of us talk about decency, about honor, decency. about loyalty, honor, about gratitude. Loyalty. Gratitude. We <laughs> talk about these things. He lived them. He didn't if talk about them. He lived Lord them. He would be laid out front. He would carry your cross up the hill for you. So the... Okay, let's quit. The Bible was the template for a lot of this in Faulkner in ways that are more generally shared. And that... That's a theme that we see with Theaster Gates. The Bible is Theaster Gates' template, as is Dostoevsky in various ways. But let's, let's let our, we got commentators from a couple of you. Why don't we let you launch a, launch a little bit of discussion, linking here, let's say, uh, to make your points that we heard in the, during our break. Can we move Sure, we sure. Please, please do, but, but let's, if it get, can you can you all keep talking or you want me to talk? That is, we don't want to wait for the PowerPoint. Is what I'm saying. Um, but let's have stuff nonstop. <laughs> okay, but, but we got we got we got eight minutes left, so let's go. <laughs> um, so in the first reading, um, Music City by Jonathan Lynn, um, there are a couple of um, terms that go he. Ahead. He keeps making a projector would be up in the middle. Okay, um, there are a couple of. Uh, terms that he introduced to describe um, the festival process and how it affects like uh, scene, what is this going on? Sorry. Um, so the first one, um, he talked about festi festivalization, um, which is the process um, wherein short-term events are used to develop, reinforce, and export an array of communal goods, turning out costs and benefits. Um, and he also uh, described he also described festivals as occasional publics, um, which is a sort of unique because it's a lot of different people um, with diverse occupations and interests and basically goals um, that come together and put on this event and they all get like different benefits out of it. Um, he um, he conducted his um, research using um, four different he's three different cities. Uh, that there are different, different music festivals and used um, um, interviews and ethnograph, which is where he like both like um, participated in the different activities of the different people um, that were putting on the festival. Um, walks with purpose to evaluate um, the different uh, econo uh, economic like areas of the city and um, surveys. So he um, studied three. Um, Music festivals in Newport, Austin, and Nashville. Um, do you want to give a resource? Yeah, and so he looked at these four different types of resources of these festivals. So there's economic resources, which is, um, you know, if the financial benefits of this festival exceeds the local investment, right? So like long, so you're doing a short-term sacrifice. Maybe we talked about with like planting the grass and all this stuff is going to be damaged. You're going to have to reroute transportation. But is the city going to have some long-term benefits from this? And you can um, measure this through visitor spending, hotel rooms booked, uh, transportation taxes that and then there's also spatial resources which it could be a public or private space so you could have um, a public space could be a park or um, um, convention centers private spaces could be concert halls or bars so you can utilize these in different ways and then you have these social and cultural uh, resources which is uh, in the case of Austin for example there's these amazing local musicians that they use um, from there but like in Newport it's very small area, they need to bring in um, these type of um, artists from around the world so um, 
basically he discussed how these three festivals uh, is a case study in which all three of them utilize these resources in a different way depending on their environment um, and they can create unique experiences with the, the attendees in the event. Um, and so one of the questions I kind of wanted to get the class like um, I was interested in personally is um, if there have been any music festivals yourself where you've seen these differences in the public private space and you could feel it as a participant um, where you could see the differences in how these festivals were run and kind of like how you interacted with like let's say the artists or with the people around you based off of how these festivals were run um, so I thought that would be an interesting um, discussion um, but if we don't have any time you can kind of go on to another yeah, another point <laughs> Why don't you mention your names briefly? Uh, Tyler. 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 Yeah. I'm Hannah. I'm Courtney. And you're you're all in the college, majoring in what? Uh, public policy and psychology. Okay. Uh, public policy. Yeah. And law letters and psych. Okay. Great. Now project is up if you still need it. Oh. I don't. We don't really need right. it. Yeah. Um, but mine was the beyond attendance um, reading. And it, I know we are supposed to summarize, but I'm just going to give a quick summary. Um, it was like an SPPA survey of participation in the arts that measured measured adult levels of arts participation, attendance, creation, performance, etc. Um, it kind of, we were just talking about this, it doesn't like push for a new paradigm shift, but it kind of graciously talks about how there's like a new arts environment and new ways we should measure measure arts participation. Um, so I did a lot in this on these PowerPoints, different like numbers they came up with, like um, how ethnicity affects arts creation, how it's, um, art attendance has decreased since 2002, um, but art creation has remained stable and different um, findings like that. Um, but my questions were kind of more like class participation based, at least at first, because I wanted to see kind of like what our level of arts participation was, but there's not a ton of us here. But my first question was just kind of like, how many of you have attended an arts performance in the last 12 months? That can include like a concert, anything like that. Two thirds, good. Yeah, how many of you have created art in the last 12 months outside of the class setting? Zero, okay. Interesting. Um, how many <laughs> have you engaged with art online in some capacity? This includes like Spotify and different sources like that. Yeah, okay. A lot of us. 90%, Yeah. 80%. So then I was just gonna ask how you guys think that our U Chicago scene um, affects our participation whether it encourages it or discourages it, and then lead that into a discussion about higher education. Great, no, that, that, excellent questions. I mean, I mean we're, we won't have a long discussion, but think about this, I mean, try to think. What is there about in your dormitory, lunchroom, classroom, library experience, the conversations which feed into this, and how does it, how does it differ from the national discussions or your hometown? That, that's, that's great to think about. Okay. Yeah. I've read more than one BA on that topic. <laughs> Doing, for instance, how the dormitory, the sorry, the fraternities here are totally different than the fraternities of classic uh, Big Ten universities. They're much more secular. They're much more intellectualized. They've got, uh, they're, they're, anyway, the, the, the culture is, the, the USC general culture makes it very different from that institution on the north called Northwestern. <laughs> okay, where one of you went to college, all right. Um, so my next um, comment is about the London thing, I, the London survey I told you about. Um, it's on page 27, if any of you have it pulled up, but it mentions something about higher education as a factor that decreased arts attendance, which you more stated that it's more just that um, lower okay. classes uh, this and is lower a, This is a big point. Let's bring this out clearly as the two of you wanted, wanted to mention. So uh, pl please do. Let's go ahead and we'll discuss a little. Um, so I was just kind of wondering your thoughts on, because I would like naturally think that higher education would mean that you'd be more encouraged to participate in the arts. Um, what you were kind of saying is that um, it's not that you're less inclined to participate, it's that lower classes participate more, which makes like the relationship seem like it's slower. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on how higher education impacts arts participation? Yeah, so let, let's just get the descriptive point clear. That is, many people using the SPPA data from the National Endowment for the Arts, especially Paul DiMaggio at Princeton, showed class domination in the sense that upper status people participated more, especially in the benchmark activities, concerts, museums, traditional art, and the like. However, as I, as I discussed a week or so ago, sh this was shattered by the new leadership in the NEA. They commissioned six or so, so studies. Most of them came to Chicago, and the key new paper 
paper, it's a report, maybe 150 pages is what you're summarizing. It's quick bottom line finding is there's a minimal relationship between education, income, social status on the one hand, and arts participation on the other. It's much weaker than people thought in the past. So, in, But it's not that university people participate less, it's that lower status people participate more if you include gospel, hip hop, rock, and more po so-called popular culture. Lollapalooza is big, big stuff. If you include Lollapalooza, you get very different results than if you include only the CSO. Okay, so that's that, and that and that holds that holds roughly similarly in other studies in France and England and, and, and in other places. So excellent to 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 to, to bring it out. And as as we discussed, uh, this is. Um, uh, uh, what's her name? Jen Jennifer um, uh, is is the is the author of the report. She's she's gracious. She does not have a conflictual style of writing, and it's not done to say here's a new paradigm. It's all sort of scientifically ad adding new findings. But the cumulative result is the old paradigm is wrong, basically. Or that is, or it's it's limited, and we have a new paradigm beginning. But where and how should this take shape is what is what she's feeding into, and she's been working actively on this ever since. She's now the leading leading person probably in the world trying to capture how do people participate in the arts, and she's very actively consulting with with NEA. She's uh, she's she's here at the Cultural Policy Center for several years, and she's now uh, on the faculty at Vanderbilt as a, a cultural center. Did you have, did you have more folks? Um, my last question is kind of just one to think about. Um, we don't want to discuss it because it's more philosophical, but I'm just wondering where we draw the line of what is art and what is not, because there's so many new technologies and different things emerging that make it hard to measure what counts as art and what doesn't, and things we do on our phones, like creating like Snapchats that have like interesting artistic features and Bitmojis and different things like that. They're all creative expressions, but how do we define if that's art or if it's not? Um, then I had a video to show, but obviously we don't have time, so. Okay. Maybe send it around to us, and we'll we'll look at the video. But th those are those are excellent points. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Good good discussion, all. All right. Unfortunately, we are at the at the end of the hour, but we will we're open to more stuff for posting on posting on uh, chalk, and and we'll con we'll continue with some of these discussions, uh, and and we'll we'll have a visitor, distinguished visitor. Emily Taylor here on, on Wednesday for, for ha half the class. She'll, she'll be talking. And we'll continue some of these themes, but we're also especially incorporating student presentations and papers. So if you haven't, uh, please you know, give, us your, give us your latest thoughts on that if you're, if you're working on a paper draft through the through whoever you've been working with, because we want to assemble a, a, a schedule and agenda for who, who wants to present so we can figure out how to fill in the agenda for, with, with other things to, contingent on the number of people uh, who, who have papers to, and ideas, even if they're not fixed papers, you can still present and say, I'm having trouble writing my paper, and I'd like help on this. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. End of the end today.